Hello, good morning. Welcome to Zodiac. That's great coming to you live from our studios in Kokomini. We're on DTT because we're free to air. Coming up this morning, National Chief Imam's Office welcomes uh, calls by the 7th Adventist Church for a review of the voting day of December 7, which falls on Saturday, the Sabbath day, but calls for a wider consultation. We'll hear that proposal by the SCA and also have a conversation with the Office of the National Chief Imam. Also this morning, Momo fraud persists with many people losing their money to cyber fraudsters, even after linking their SIM cards to the Ghana card. A measure touted to fight the menace. How do we win this war? We'll find out from the experts. And economists are predicting tough times for whoever wins the 2024 elections. How so? More from the experts who were on PM Express last night with Ivan Mensa major you know issue coming down where we basically pick the can down mm -hmm. the line uh, uh, if uh, government uh, that comes in we'll have to pick up the men we have details of all of this plus business coming up shortly my name is Aisha Ibrahim do stay for details <laughs> The Office of the National Chief Imam has welcomed proposals by the Seventh-day Adventist Church calling for a possible review of the December 7th date for general elections. The church says the date for this year's elections falls on the Sabbath, a day dedicated to the worship of God, in a bid to avert a situation which excludes members from voting on that day and a future recurrence, the SDA Church is calling for consideration of the first and second Tuesdays in November as election days. Join us as Blessed Soga has more. Sabbath day to keep it holy. These words of the Holy Bible for any Christian must be and should be kept sacred. But for the Seventh-day Adventist Church Ghana, their faith is about being tested like never before. Similar to 1996, the presidential and parliamentary elections this year falls on Saturday, December 7. According to the teachings of the church, it will be Sabbath, a day fully dedicated to the worship of God. At the Southern Ghana Union Conference here in Accra, I met Dr. Solis Asafo, Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. She explains to me how the democratic gains of the country will be derailed if provisions are not made to cater for members of this church. Voting is a civic responsibility. Honoring the Sabbath is a godly responsibility. That's how we see it. Um, as enshrined in the Ten Commandments, he says you have six days to do all your work, but you have to rest on the Sabbath day. And you know, uh, sometimes people don't understand, but in that commandment, it says that the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of thy Lord. If it were mine, I would decide on what to do with it. But it's God's, and he says on this day, don't do this or do this. So that's where the conflict comes up. And that's why we think that uh, if there's anything that can be done to change the date, it will help our members. Uh, and now we know that you've sent your petition to the Electoral Commission detailing your concerns and what it is, the challenges you have about uh, December 7th and the need to either move the date to November or try and get uh, a date that will not be a Saturday. Have you taken any other step to raise your concerns to the state and to put across your demands? In June 2021, we actually had an appearance with the President of the Republic and placed before him our concerns. We followed that up subsequently by writing to the Electoral Commission in February last year, indicating or making a proposal for a change what we were proposing was not for a definite a date change, but we were proposing a day. So we proposed in our submission to the EC the first uh, Tuesday or a Tuesday in November or December.
Meanwhile, the Electoral Commission says it has taken receipts of the petition from the church but will make no comment yet because a final decision has not been taken on the matter. Let's get on to uh, that story. Government's efforts to combat the rising tide of mobile money fraud requiring users to compulsorily link their SIM cards to the Ghana cards was hailed as a move to cap fraudulent activities that had become a growing concern in the mobile money sector. It was expected that tying each SIM card to a verified identity could thwart fraudulent activities, protect users and maintain the integrity of financial transactions. In the following feature, Michael Ashali reports that the Momo Frosters continue to prey on the unsuspecting public. Mobile money fraud has now become so pervasive. The motive is varied, but the bottom line is to get money from you. These deceptive schemes often commence with a seemingly ordinary text message, characterized by glaring grammatical errors. Spelling errors and poor construction in fraudulent messages might just be a deliberate strategy employed by cyber criminals. When you see the bad spelling, it is not as if they can't smell. Dr. Kenneth Ashigbe, the chief executive officer of the Ghana Chamber of Telecommunications, suggests that the use of poor grammatical constructions by the frosters is just an attempt to circumvent their new artificial intelligence-enabled system. The confirm, maybe the R that is there, they will make it an S. They will change a few of the things in there so that once... The AI is crawling it. He sees it. It's not what it is that he's looking for. So, but fortunately for us, now we're beginning to use AIs. So what the AIs do is that once they see all of this, they learn. So they start seeing the spelling mistakes that you want to beat them. Other times, these fosters will call you with promises to lure you to send them money. Oh, Oh, was almost scammed weeks ago. He now knows the plot of these frosters very well. No, they will just call you like normal call, and then he will say hello. So he will not even ask your name first. No, he will just say, it is me, your auntie, who is in London. And then personally, I don't have any auntie in London. So I just say, who, 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 which of my aunties in London? He said, oh, have you forgotten? Then you mentioned some name. So I just said, no, no, I don't have any auntie in London. So. As unsuspecting individuals continue to fall victims to various schemes, the tactics employed by these fosters continue to evolve. Someone will just call you and be like, uh, when will I receive the money? Uh, uh, please, I've sent you this money. Can you confirm? And several calls of that, several calls. They were asking me, when am I paying my debt? So I asked, with debt? And then he said, said the debt I was owing him. If the way he, the person responded again and spoke with me again, I realized eh, it was one of these frosters. Like I deposit 1,000 CDs into my accounts. And the person I was calling me, I sent 250,000 CDs into my account. So they have sent 250,000 CDs to your account? To my account. I should withdraw it back to him. Then I went back to check my account and I noticed that, nah, it was a lie. And I bust up him by giving, me, I giving some sense into his head. Rose and Okwe have been victims of cyber fraud. And when they called me, they said they've sent me some amount of 400 setters. So I should check by dialing my PIN. So then I was very curious. My brother asked me not to do it, but I told him, being a good Samaritan, I, but I didn't know that maybe it's true or it's not true. But the moment I just dialed my PIN code, they just took the money. And later on, I called them to beg them that, please, the money was for something important. They should send the money back to me. But they refused. And I called MTN. MTN told me they would get back to me. But nothing. The string number called me. Then he was like, he sent me money. So I should check my account. But after that time, I didn't receive the, I didn't receive the money. So some few minutes later, the message came from MTN. Like, it was MTN. Like, if you see money, blah, 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 from MTN. But it was coming from a to-go line. So what I was just suspicious, like, how will I receive? The person introduced himself as a worker from a, from a telecom company. Yes, that he works at MTN and he sent the money to me. 
then all right the, the message came all right as mtm but it was coming from a school line so i still read the message i realized that there was spelling mistakes and all that from it so i realized that he called again that he sends me the money have i checked my account i should check my account that instantly and i was like no the message we sent was even wrong and this is not how messages appear from mtn and all that then he was pressuring me then i should just check my account number and i was like no there's no way i'm checking my account because of that he got bored they started insulting me i just hung up mobile money operators are not even spared they'll tell you that uh, they want to uh, check they want to help you with some difficulties that you are facing in the business for me they've been calling but me the moment you said i'm from mcn i'll just end the call i don't listen because mcn has only one number the modus of brandy has however evolved over the years you know, like Tim Achebe would say, when the hunter learns to shoot without missing, the birds learn to fly without perching. Now, they pose as agents of some of the mobile networks under the guise that you were a lucky winner of a draw. I'm Linda Ofori. Our calls are recorded for education and training purposes. So for detailed understanding, are you okay with the English or should I speak to you in any local language? Oh, but you are already communicating in English. Thank you. We are 28 years. Could you remember the number of years you've also been on a network where there is a very particular mobile number? I think about 15 or so. Okay, so you are very close. I'm going to remind you of um, the year you registered the same card. So MC, we thank you very much. We were asking all these questions to actually survey the network to know how good or bad it's performing. From enticing phone calls promising rewards to posing as mobile network agents, the aim of the scammers is simple. Extract your personal information and use them to later impersonate you. So we have um, a very nice package for you. And please, with the prizes we have for you, you have to visit the nearest MTN branch with your valid ID card, that is your Ghana card, to receive your package successfully. So first of all, MTN is giving you 50 cities airtime for free. You can use this airtime for both local and international calls. Secondly, you're also receiving a 2 gigabyte data bundle. Uh, it, it has no expiry. And finally, Hisense Company Limited, so Hisense is giving you a 2.0 house for air conditioning gadget. So please, um, I would like to confirm your AC numbers. Please, what are your AC numbers over there? What number? Having to receive any AC number? Your AC code, please. That is six numbers, please. Okay. But, okay, you said I should tell you what it is. We, we are verifying it for you, please, so that I can bring you to the office, please. With your Ghana card, that is all, please. But the message says, do not share. Oh, yes, please. We said, we said, hello, we said, the message in that you see, yellow MTNA. Do not share this code with any MTN employee or anyone. Okay. So we are giving reference to that. After verifying for you, no one from MTN will call you again unless you come to the office. And then this will be the message you will disclose to the, re the representative who is going to assist you about it is that there are basic things some red flag one of the red flags in that you want something red flag immediately somebody tells you one it's a red flag and that one about i have sent you some number ah another red flag some victims despite their efforts to report incidents of fraud find themselves faced with a frustrating silence from telecom companies complaints lodged against fraudulent activities often go unanswered, leaving victims without the resolution they seek. No, I didn't hear anything. I didn't. The moment, the moment someone calls me like that and I suspect the person to be a foster, after reporting them to him, I block them. Sometimes if you encounter um, a problem of that sort, I mean, it is difficult to reach out to MTN. Sometimes you can call them for some few minutes, I mean, long minutes, they will not even pick. So, Looking at the stress you go through, you just say, okay, since they did not able to take anything from me, uh, let me end it there. No, they only said I should call in 24 hours. And within that 24 hours, I called again and they said they can't do anything about it. And I got angry and hung up the call. To care this, government has since 2022 made it compulsory for every SIM card user to link it to their Ghana card for one major reason. 
By tying each SIM card to a verified identity, government sought to create a system that could thwart fraudulent activities, protect users, and maintain the integrity of financial transactions. The need for re-registration of SIM cards is obvious. There's a lot of cyber crimes that are committed by people on um, our networks with our mobile money system there's a lot of impersonation identity theft out there so for security reasons it is imperative that we register our sim cards people of all ages endured days of frustrating queues to obtain their ghana card the mandatory document for the sim card re-registration exercise today is my fifth time now i was here today Today my last day that I came. I don't know what is going to happen to me today. So today, if we did it, I didn't get it today. That I, I think I, I, they will send me to 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 military barracks. Subsequently, they faced further frustration, spending additional hours in another line to link their SIM cards to the acquired Ghana card. I believe if they can do something about it, because there are there are a lot of people behind me. However, despite the well-intentioned move, the cyber criminals are undeterred. It appears, with each step taken by government, the scammers employ various schemes to outwit unsuspecting victims and exploit weaknesses in the system. They found ways. So now what happens? Generally, some of the new ways that you know you, know, you and I are entitled to 10 numbers that we can register at maximum. So they will see a few of our friends who do not really understand what these things mean give them some 20 cds and then they'll go with them and they'll go and register the sims in their names some sim card subscribers believe that some employees within the telecom companies collude with frosters sharing the personal information of their subscribers this shared information they believe is then exploited against the unsuspecting subscriber i think there are some people in the office in the mcn office that works with those scammers but sometimes how they even get your number and everything is strange. Every, most of the same cards in Ghana is registered with the Ghana card. So if you report, it should be easy to find those people. Do you think the systems in Ghana can do that? <laughs> even when you report and they trace, they won't end up seeing anybody or they won't end up arresting anybody. So sometimes you just have to be vigilant and then be, be careful about it. Dr. Ashigbe, however, says the telecommunication companies are exploring other novel means to sanitize the space. Because another thing that we've done is that on the, as a chamber, we have what we call the fraud control dashboard. So when things like this happen and it's reported, the first thing is that the MNO to whom it's reported would investigate it. When they establish that fraud has been perpetuated, what they then would do is that they would then go and block that person's number, the, ID, the, uh, the phone number would be blocked. When the phone number is blocked, they then go by and then every phone has an IMSDI number, and a unique number to a phone. Though some of the clone numbers, uh, phones, you know, can clone it. So they will block the device as well. So what will happen is that if I use this to do it, then this device will be blocked. I can't use it anymore. But then they will then report it on the FCD. So if it's uh, operator A who reported on FCD, then the other uh, two operators as well would also block that device. So what it would mean that that device cannot be used in Ghana again. Then if that particular ID behind it has been used in perpetuating multiple fraud, then we would go back again and then block the ID. So once they blacklist the ID, you can't use the ID to register any uh, SIM again. Despite the initial challenges posed by mobile money fraud, telecom companies maintain the belief that integrating the Ghana cards with SIM cards will ultimately prove instrumental in eliminating fraudulent activities. Subscribers earnestly hope for a more robust and responsive telecom service when addressing their content related to mobile money, particularly in handling and resolving complaints. For Joy News, Michael Ashale. Well, I've been joined by Henry Kobler, his team lead of ISOLV Africa. Grateful for your time for this conversation. I mean, linking our cards uh, was supposed to be an ideal solution to all these problems. What happened? Because we're still here. Thank you very much. Um, 
So I must say that generally when it comes down to systems, I, I mean, telecommunication systems, I mean, looking up at the ads, um, generally I feel that it's a process um, and sort of would basically take some level of time. I've seen policymakers pushing some level of effort in making sure that that process had gone through. We've had a lot of back and forth into it, but generally when it goes down to te um, tech processes itself, it basically takes a bit of time um, in, in the point of um, implementation. And so, um, yes, we've looked at the cards coming into play, which is a very good thing in the <coughs> processes that is available, uh, and then being able to link up with the cards which is in the systems. I am seeing um, some level of effort being made by the telecommunication networks to, I mean, curb some of these issues. But generally, I feel that it's a bigger problem on our hands where we're seeing that there's quite a lot of these complaints coming. Um, users do not sometimes even know where to place these complaints to and the results coming in in place for you. Um, I have had quite a lot of people I mean, getting on to some of these scams. The scams keep evolving. Um, some of these scams looks like it's an insider processes. And um, it's really hard to even hear news about some of these um, arrests being made in, in terms of connecting to some of these frauds. And so it gives users that point where sometimes when they get to be before that they do not even sometimes go ahead to go through the processes of calling the telco <coughs> all of that and that becomes a bigger problem because when you're having the citizenry not able to or having knowledge and understanding the processes of reporting some of these um scams uh, and getting some level of results assuring results it becomes a bigger problem for us in the system then Sorry, your question again. What will it take to clean the system of, I mean, these fraudsters who will be calling and seeking to get your information and also to use it for fraudulent activities? I think number one, the very first process is to sort of have a dedicated call center where some of these fraudulent activities are sort of reported in real time and in, in the quickest of time and some level of actions are taking in, in, in that time frame. Um, having that dedicated, I mean, connection or, or I mean, call center to to give the citizens some level of um, assurance that they could always call is the very first process of cleaning the system because they know and it's actually placed out there. There's a lot of education on it that gives people to understand that if you're frauded, the next number that you're calling is as if you're calling a fire service or otherwise, because financial fraud is becoming a bit of challenge. Mobile money is becoming one of the most used transactional points in Ghana. So we should sort of treat it as um, a major hurdle. This is not really just to the telecos. There are quite a lot of fraudulent activities that are coming on to I mean, the banking systems, ATM systems, card systems, I mean, quite a lot of them. And so when we're having dedicated centers, which is dedicated to telecom fraud or mobile money fraud, I think that becomes a bit of, of good ones. Um, number two, I think that some level of publications in terms of the 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 the, the um, the people that are into this fraud could actually also raise some level of alarm because when we're seeing people's faces to this crime and there's some level of effort in arresting them and prosecuting them in, in that fast track manner, I think that it helps in um, sanitizing the processes. I am predicting that in the next five years, we're going to have a heightened um, a bit of fraud in, 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 in the telecommunication system and in the IT system itself. As, as a whole. And so um, there's that high need of a lot of change um, by most of these telecos and banking systems to be looking into cybersecurity um, trainings for most of their, their employers. Um, and even the people that they sort of interact with, most of the merchants that they sort of um, link up to, there's supposed to be a lot of education and trainings which will go into helping the, these employers to be able to get ahead of time and to be able to keep some of these menace which is in there. Um, and then the next thing I think should be should be coming in place is the linking of almost all the systems. I feel that there's quite a lot of disintegration when it comes down to the systems. And so if you want to track someone um, who's, who's got a card or whose SIM card has been used in fraud and um, you track it to the Ghana card, the Ghana card is they should be looking up to a GPS system. And so that makes location easy to track and all of those things. There should be that centralization and um, syncing of these systems, which makes it easy. Um, that should even connect to all the um, banking systems, which I know is in place, but uh, there's a bit of slow processes to it, which I understand it comes with tech. 
but there should be that communication across board that if somebody is moving money, the next persons that they are even moving money to from those SIM cards are actually being blocked. And so it's not just about the person that um, is, is in the crime, but the perpetrators are around the crime. Because when money hits onto that SIM card, it's moved onto several SIM cards. And by tracking those SIM cards, you can be able to now put the money and then now get to the, the persons. I think that these processes could come in place. Um, some level of policy heightened who come in. I've seen that there were taxes that were placed on to help um, improve cyber security. I've not seen implementation of that. I've seen cyber security agencies and the Ghana police service come into play. Um, I think that there should be more of work to be done in, in that sector and some level of persecutions that can come in. I mean, um, even if you're having dedicated, I mean, court systems which are coming in place to curb financial fraud, I think that a lot of people would actually put themselves in place. There are quite a lot of things which is going on. Um, for an example, you're having Ghana being called out of PayPal just because you're having quite a lot of Nigerians coming to Ghana to commit, I mean, fraud on, on that level. Like, so you're having your country taking out. That's a big issue. And for me, I, I think that the cuts across not just mobile money, but the banking systems, any financial systems, the fintech systems that are all around, there should be that heightened level of cybersecurity alertedness that could come into place for us. Henry Kobla, I'm grateful for your time. He's lead team, team lead of uh, iSolve Africa. Grateful that you're able to join us for this conversation. We can now uh, go back to our earlier conversation on the office of the chief imam agreeing uh, with the SDA's demands for the December 7 date for general elections to be pushed to another date uh, because they need to observe Sabbath. I've been joined by Sheikh Arimeyao, uh, who is the spokesperson of the National Chief Imam. Grateful for your time, Sheikh. Sheikh, I'm grateful to have you this morning on Joy News Desk. Good. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. So you agree that voting, the voting date of uh, December 7th should be changed, but uh, there have been times when the date has fallen on Friday, the day uh, of Juma. That's the biggest congregational prayer for Muslims. It's also falling sometimes on Sundays, the worship day for most Christians. I mean, is this not just an isolated case? Um, well... Um, the issue is it's not even like qualifying it as an isolated case, but you are looking at the generality of Ghana as a nation and the right of everybody to practice his religion and to give manifestation to it as guaranteed by the provisions of our, of our constitution. Now, the, um, central to democracy are certain essentials, um, some of which are um, respect for human rights, um, the issue of participation, um, inclusion, um, equity fairness in our national uh, scheme of things. So if going by these principles, then one could say that in any time we are making an arrangement, we do it in such a way that not every, not, uh, no single community formed around a certain identity will be isolated or whose right will not be given its fullest stretch um, and so on. And that is the reason why uh, this idea when it came, we were not opposed to it. We were not opposed to the, the, the idea. So if it's about inclusion, if it's about participation, then we can give a look to it. And I don't think that it is a, a something which we can consider as an isolated case or unjustifiable. Okay, in the event that, I mean, this conversation, I mean, you want wider consultations. Once uh, we all agree that, okay, we should change the date because the SDAs are asking for the first and second Tuesdays of November or so for the elections. This is a scenario, uh, uh, something that can happen because a lot of people think that it would open the floodgates. Imagine that a, um, I mean, it's pushed to the first week, uh, the first Tuesday and first and second Tuesday of November, and it falls. It happens that Eid, for instance, happens on that day. That means that we would also be calling for the dates to be changed. Um, that that is why it is a subject that must be brought to. Uh, 
the public domain for some engagement and dialogue. Um, um, we, the, the two major religions that we have in the country are, are Islam and, and, and Christianity. And within the Christian domain also, we have different different denominations. Um, the SDA um, is the one that we know that holds Saturday so sacred that nothing happens. And then on Sundays, we know how the whole of the day is used by different, even within the same church, you will notice that different sections of the worship hour are, are, are organized. So, and then we may have even within our traditional setup certain days that are considered as uh, a day that you cannot do anything uh, there. Uh, so, it is a matter that needs to be brought to the public domain for some dialogue and for some engagement, uh, so, so that together all of us we can agree. We may not get it as perfectly as we want, but at least then the issue has been brought to the public domain, it has been debated, and then we have found a certain middle of the road um, on, the, on, on, the, on the matter. What, what would be the ideal situation from the Islamic point of view? No, for us Islam, for us Islam, yes, Friday is an important day. It's an important day, but it is not a holiday for us. But at a time of prayer, it is prohibited for, for the Muslim, the true Muslim, to engage in any mundane activity where he sacrifices the worship of God within the time that prayer is in session. The Holy Quran makes it very, very, very clear that whenever the call to prayer is made on Friday, he said that stop, stop any other worldly activity and hasten to the remembrance of God. So that is a positive injunction. So it's an injunction for us here within that period. In fact, you cannot sacrifice the prayer in order that you go and cast your vote. Um, because for us, it's a law uh, in Islam. Um, but the whole day, it is not considered a holiday in such a way that you cannot engage in any activity because after the prayer, we are permitted to go ahead with our mundane activities. So our challenge is just at the time of our prayer, uh, uh, no Muslim, no Muslim will sacrifice the Friday prayer in order to go and cast because it's a, it's a, it is seen as a mundane, mundane activity. Uh -huh. So, so, but I we say so in order that we respect the. The, the days that are held sacred by the different religions uh, so that democracy is about participation and everybody must have the opportunity to be able to cast his vote in a very peaceful and fair environment without feeling intimidated, without feeling isolated, without feeling constrained or restrained by any other, any, any circumstance. Uh -huh. So for us, if we succeed in really getting a compromise day in which nobody's religious practice is compromised or nobody's religious right, you know, is undermined, I think that it will go a long way to also continue to unify us as a nation because our unity centers around our mutual recognition, solidarity, cooperation, um, mutual respect. And, and, and these are the very, very ingredients that hold us together as a nation, so that no, no group will feel um, isolated or marginalized or deprived on the foundation or on, by just reason of an identity, whether religious or ethnic. Now, if we're able to resolve some of this, it helps deepen our democracy and our peace and security is also enhanced. For your time, uh, Sheikh Arimea, now, uh, Shaibu, before I, 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 I leave you, uh, the SDA says that it, uh, it's backing its uh, demands on the report of the Constitutional Review Commission. What do you want to see, I mean, with regards to this? Uh, come again. The Constitutional Review uh, report, the SDA says it's backing its uh, demand on this report. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, uh, for me, I think that uh, we, as a nation, uh, in my view, um, we, I, in quotes, I say it, it's a failure. Um, 
And for me, it's an embarrassment to the whole nation uh, that we spent a huge sum of money. I'm not too sure about the sum, but I'm told it comes to about some, is it, I don't know, is it six million dollars or six, or six hundred thousand dollars or something, something. I, I beg, I'm not too sure, but I know a certain huge sum of money was used to really come out with this huge compendium. The, 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 the volume, the sheer volume of the report alone and the money that went into it, and for us not to have applied it, for me, it, it really flies in, in, in the face of our quest to really to deepen our, our democracy. So if it is something was included in the uh, Consular Review Committee's report, then we are obliged, just by this of the fact that we use state money, state money, state money, durable, strong U.S. dollars that was used. And I think that it would be so wasteful, and I think it doesn't give a, a sense of our good planning and management of our resources that we'll spend such a huge amount of money to do a report, and that report, the content of the report will not be applied. Uh, I think, I think uh, then we, 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 that money could have been used to build hospitals, could have been used to build a certain school, uh, for some people to build a certain road or a certain bridge. If we knew that we would not apply the content of such a report of such an important, you know, uh, item of our democracy, then we could have used that money in building something that would be a utility, you know, to the most deprived members of our community. So, so I go with the idea that once it, is, it found a place in the report of the CRC, then we, we need to apply it. I'm grateful for your time. Sheikh Harim Eyal Shaibu, he's a spokesperson for the National Chief Imam. Economists are predicting tough times for whoever wins the 2024 elections. It follows a successful restructuring by Ghana's external creditors and a scheduled IMF executive board's meeting on Friday to consider the first review of Ghana's $3 billion rescue loan program. Economist and political risk analyst Dr. Theo Champo, who made the prediction on PM Express last night, said Ghana's current status will put a lot of pressure on whoever wins the presidential election in December. In uh, an election that is going to be, in my view, one of the most competitive and closely fought, right? Mm. So then the argument now begin, begins, or begins to go into where are the channels or the pockets that we will see some of these savings and some of these quote-unquote spending happening. And one of the things that I think we need to check very, very carefully is through the state-owned enterprises, because those of balance sheet things, believe you me, when we come 2025 uh, um, with whatever government that is there and whatever review under the IMF program, you will see a number of state-owned enterprises that have been, you know, caught in, yeah. in, in, in that web. And, and, and that also then means, that also quickly lastly means that those targets that we have under the IMF program is meant to end 2026. I suspect the program will go into 2027, 2028. Okay, and which means that your proposal, your suggestion is, we're possibly going to miss our targets and create a, a big, a, a much bigger challenge for whoever wins 2024, for 2025 going forward to manage. Yes, on, on, yeah. on, the, on the expenditure side of, of things. Yeah. You will see on growth, inflation, those things, the numbers are beginning to moderate, yeah. but you won't see it improving livelihoods overnight. Okay. But you've got a major, you know, issue coming down where basically you've kicked the can down, down the, the line. Uh, uh, the uh, government uh, that comes in will have to pick up the mess. Professor of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Gottfried Buckwin, corroborating this position, explained there has always been unexplained expenditures and mismanagement of the economy during election years, adding the IMF program is likely to extend as a result of this. He says there's an urgent need for a sustainable fiscal policy to guide such activities, especially during election years. He also spoke on PM Express. Thank you, Dr. Tua Champon. Um, from last year, when the program was approved and we analyzed it, our conclusion was that this program was designed with the extension in mind. Keep that in mind. But are we meeting our, our first three years targets? Considering uh, election year. There's, there's, a, there's, there's real risk that the 2024 may derail the program uh, outcome 
and probably to bring it back on track, there's a possibility of, of, of an extension. Bear, bear that in mind, yeah. Okay. Uh, set up. We will see the reality of this in the last quarter of this year. The election really is gathering momentum, and I'm sure Honorable will be coming down very soon and all of that, right? But watch the space. The last four months of almost all the competitive election years, nobody manages anything in this country. Ask them. That's Some first-year students of the University of Ghana are stranded as they have been turned away by the various school halls for accommodation after being told the halls are full. Most of the students have been left to their fate to search for accommodation, with some of those that came from far forced, being forced to patch with relatives and friends for the time being. My colleague Kenneth Jesse has been engaging some of them and has more in this report. New academic year, more accommodation troubles for some students of the University of Ghana. They have been denied entry into the school halls, which is the cheapest source of accommodation on campus. They've been told to look elsewhere. The news team spoke with some of them who have come from far and wide. Listen to them. Where are you coming from? Northern region, Tamale. Northern region. Yes, please. And you came here and still haven't gotten accommodation on campus? Yes, please. Yeah. So, how are you coping? Where do you stay now? I'm with my uncle at Medina. So, yeah, I come from there every time. How is this affecting you? It's stressful. Yes. Because we charge a lot with the taxi drivers. It's so stressful, yeah. You obviously wanted to be uh, on the school or in one of the school halls yes, and you didn't get. Mm -hmm. What were you told? Um, for me, it's actually my fault. I didn't pay my fees on time, so I didn't get a place in the school. Mm, they said it's full. It's limited. It's randomly picked, so when you didn't apply fast, it's, it's now full, so couldn't get some. And so how is that affecting you? Mm, I have to leave the house always, like wake up very early so that I'll not miss classes. Okay, so that means you're coming from Medina every day? Yes, please. Those that managed to get accommodation at the school hall say it is very expensive due to a recent increment. I used to know that it was 750 per semester, but now um, when we... When we got the hall, they were like 1,000 CD per semester. They pay some other levies and stuff. So actually, it has gone high, oh, the prices. The chair of the heads of halls at the University of Ghana, Dr. Margaret Amankwa Puku, however, says accommodation for first-year students on campus is not guaranteed and defended the school's policy to increase fees for residential halls by some 33%, saying the cost of living in Ghana has triggered that increment. So, um, you know, initially the students were paying a little over 800 cities a year. And then um, about a year and a half ago, we increased it to 1,500 cities per year. So it came up to um, 750 cities per year and so it's been a year and a half now but you know how cost of living has increased um, price of goods and services have increased um, and I was yesterday I was mentioning that janitorial services for example we were paying um, 13 a little over 13,000 a month for Volta Hall but now we are paying 28,000 a month so it's more than doubled. And um, fixing damages and faults that are reported by students, etc. And that is why um, we wrote to the ProVC to permit us to increase the residential facility user fees. The issue of accommodation challenges on the various university campuses is not new. Each year they come up, each year it dies slowly. From the campus of the University of Ghana, Kenneth Jesse for Joy News.
Take a break on Joy News Desk. We'll be back with more. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Bank of Ghana will embark upon a sizable monetary easing cycle, cutting the policy rate by a cumulative 800 basis points to 22% by the end of the year. That's forecast by Fish Solutions. This, it says, follows a substantial moderation of headline inflation. Yes, more in this report. Since 2021, the Bank of Ghana has hiked the benchmark policy rate by 1,150 basis points to 30 percent, thus as restricted access to corporate credit. But with inflation easing substantially, the central bank is expected to embark upon policy easing. However, Fitch Solutions said it usually takes about 12 months for interest rate adjustment to affect the real economy due to the lag in monetary transmission mechanisms. As such, the UK-based firm believes that the Bank of Ghana's dovish monetary policy stance is unlikely to result in a sharp increase in real loan growth, which has remained in contractionary territory over January to August last year. Meanwhile, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana would hold 116th regular meetings from Tuesday, January 23 to Friday, January 26 to review development in the economy. All right, in other news, Associate Director Tax and Regulatory Services at Deloitte was on panels and treating local businesses to take advantage of some tax exemptions by the government. Speaking on the marketplace on Joy News, Mr. Pano urged businesses to leverage existing tax exemptions to reduce the tax burden. Here, where you have um, high tax costs, all companies, all businesses will have to make sure that they are identifying all tax deductions available to them and all tax incentives and make sure that they are making the most out of it. Typical example is that we have already in our law a deduction for um, additional deduction when you employ fresh graduates. A company is taking advantage of this. Uh, you can get up to 50% of the salaries and wages of fresh graduates. So this is a time to look out for uh, what the deductions are available for the company and make sure you are getting the most out of all your deductions, whether it means you are keeping the right records, you are having the supporting uh, documents to support your expenses, and of course, taking advantage of uh, things like the graduate deduction uh, that we have available to companies. And in this year, we've had some companies having some exemption. Uh, local production of sanitary towels will now go at 0% uh, VAT. So companies in that space to make sure that they are taking advantage of that um, this year and going forward. Then lastly, uh, what I would say is that in a high tax environment, businesses should have a tax rate strategy. Mm -hmm. um, there are changes, I mentioned yesterday that um, I would describe our tax system as fluid because these changes keep coming and um, it means different things for different businesses. You would have to have a tax strategy where you identify where your tax rates will come from. Because coupled with these changes in taxes, um, it's also a drive from the Revenue Authority uh, to implement a robust uh, tax audit system. So businesses should have a tax strategy, identify where their tax rates is coming from, and have a plan around what you would do in your next tax audit and how you plan to uh, assess or how you plan to handle right. that tax audit. All right, the Business Advisory Series continues this afternoon on the Marketplace at 2 p.m. Stay with us. News Desk returns after this break. This morning, my name is Aisha Brian. Welcome to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.